All right. So Abel, I'm wondering if you could treat us with a little journey today. Yeah. Your- where do you want to start, Tara? <laughs> <laughs> I want to start with what got you started in health and fitness in the first place. And then like, if we can go through the epic hero's journey of the highs and lows of through that journey, like what you found, but let's start like, where, where did you start out? Cause everybody knows you're the fat burning man, but like, how'd you get there? Yeah, it was a wiggly road. <laughs> so long, I guess the long version is, uh, it, it's really my mom who got me into this. And the combination wow. with my dad and and their family, lots of kids grew up uh, in New Hampshire. And that was a dairy farm. They were kind of doing it the oh, right on. organic kind of no spray permaculture way, nice. before, way before that was a thing. You're right. But when I was uh, just an infant, I got really, really sick and, and mm. couldn't kick a high temperature. And so they pumped mm. me full of everything they had. Right. So to this day, I'm still allergic to pretty much every antibiotic there is. Mm. And so my mom had a problem, right? Because the kids would get sick. My brother actually was and still is allergic to a lot of the same drugs and antibiotics and all that. So my mom, who was already a nurse, w- hit the books even harder and learned about uh, being an, and became an herbalist and then wrote a book about herbs and incorporating mm-hmm. them into clinical practice. I love her. <laughs> her own, yeah, she's the best. She's the best. <laughs> yeah. But then, of course, you know, so I was kind of raised in this health nut world where she yeah. was running into the backyard and wild crafting and making tinctures and bombs Amazing. to heal me and teas and all that instead of, you know, I wanted to take Clearasil when I got <laughs> Poison. You know, you know. I love her. Oh, totally. can I get her on the podcast next? <laughs> <laughs> you should, yeah, she would love that. But uh, yeah, so anyway, I of course wanted to rebel against that completely when right. I went to school and then I went to an Ivy League college and took on loans and then got a big fancy job to pay off those loans and big fancy health insurance. And I'm like, well, this is the right way. I'm going to do this super hard. And after right. about like a year of going into the doctor pretty much every, every two weeks, maybe once a month, peeing, blood taken, looking at the results. The good part is I, I learned kind of how to read some of that blood work. Mm. The bad news is that after a little more than a year of that and moonlighting and working too hard, being stuck in an office, working in consulting and programming and all that, yeah. uh, I was, I would I put on probably 25, 30 pounds. Mm. I had high triglycerides, big puffy face. And, um, and then the thing that really put me over the edge there after trying to eat very low fat, I was still running a lot. Um, I was trying to eat almost no dietary cholesterol and all that. So I'm getting right. fat. I'm getting, you know, going down the road of heart disease that I was trying to prevent by following this advice based on family yeah. history. Da, 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 da. And then I lose everything in an apartment fire, like everything. Wow. And I'm broke. I had just kind of like gotten over the hump and, and paid off most of the loans, but I'm, I'm broke. I'm sick. I've lost everything. And I just looked at myself in the mirror and I'm like, you kind of got to work on this dude. <laughs> I felt terrible. I looked wow. terrible. Like I was in my early twenties and, and had the body and the biomarkers of someone easily in their forties or fifties with, wow. with, you know, going down the road of serious metabolic dysfunction, if you don't kind of correct it pretty quick. And that's where I was at. So it was really going back to the world of <laughs> my mom and alternative health <laughs> and herbal healing and that kind of, yeah. I don't know, it's a more, and it was one experimental intuitive approach and mm-hmm. hitting like hardcore bodybuilding forums. I was looking at, at, at people who were way too fit or had way too much muscle, like the phys- physique competitors that can mm-hmm. get down to 3% body fat. It's like, mm-hmm these people have figured something out that I certainly haven't. Like I'm right. doing this really hard and it's not working. Maybe if I do something else really hard, it will work. Wow. And that's kind of what happened. And then that's how I found my way to the primal world eventually too, which wasn't really a, a thing back then because Mark Sisson was just getting his start. But I found Mark because he was someone who even back then was close, you know, in his mid fifties, getting close to 60 and just ripped and, yeah. and energetic. And an example of how I would want to be living perhaps like when I was getting toward my sixties and I'm like, well, how did he do that? (laughs) Then I started interviewing people who had lost more than a hundred pounds and kept it off for five years. And that's how I started up my blog and podcast because I was reaching out to these these freak successes, right? Yeah. The the successes are the weird ones, but I think there's so much we can learn from them. Definitely. 
Definitely. Wow. It's cool. So it came from your own place of passion of like, I want solutions and the proof is in the pudding. Like stop giving me all these recommendations, like show me the results. And now I want to hear what you had. So what did you, what principles did you discover as you started, you know, when did that start to shift for you into, cause like, I know we'll talk about a lot of people may know of like, my diet is better than yours. And maybe we can talk about that and, yeah. and the wild diet, but like what, what clicked, like what helps you start to shift your perception around this whole, like low fat, low cholesterol run, you know, what everybody tries to do, or at least as we were growing up, where, where did the clicking yeah. start to happen? I love that question because it wasn't just the doctor and there are many good doctors out there. It was just a doctor. And he, by the way, was a little soft himself, probably 40 pounds overweight. Right. And it's like, mm-hmm. I started to notice things like that. Mm-hmm. I started to, mm-hmm. to just be a little bit more intuitive about what made sense once I had more of an education about how the body worked. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is I was not afraid of fat and cholesterol anymore. I was more focused on eating real food. And once I did that, and uh, I had been running pretty much nonstop, like the whole time. And a lot of the misinformation that I got or the the really uh, Mm carb-heavy, carb-loading before races, after races, Gatorades, goose, all of Oh, yeah. I'm a runner, too. I feel you. Yeah, totally. Spaghetti. (laughs) It's like I had been running since since junior high track and I just loved it. Right. And so I was reading all the, all the running magazines I could, and they all said carb loading and sugar and all this. So I had to unlearn that and unlearn the orange juice from my doctor and unlearn the rest of it and then eat something. Right. And so I didn't totally give up grains. I just went more to the sourdoughs and more of the kind of just, I went to the the things that were more Western a price because mom had found that way back in the day and a few other resources like the primal thing didn't in, really invent it as much as like, you know, kept a movement going forward that has been yeah. here for a long time. People have been into macrobiotic, into staying close True. to nature for a very long time. And there are lots of different names for it, but it was really that making that jump of being afraid that it would stop my heart eating fat again and, you know, not fueling with sugar, oddly enough. Yeah. Uh, That's what I was afraid of. And once I kind of got over that fear and jumped into it and and started, you know, focusing on coconut oil and getting back to butter again and just upgrading Mm -hmm. my food quality without even any change in training, I dropped 20 plus pounds in like a month, like the first month. And then after that, I, you know, Brad Pitt and Fight Club was kind of the thing back then, like the the ideal man Mm -hmm. body. Uh, for someone in their teens and twenties. Yes, he was. was okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> totally, totally. And and then I realized that it wasn't that hard to do. It yeah. wasn't like putting it into action takes a lot of effort, of course, and you have to do the right things. But once right. you know what to do and you're willing to put it into action, right? If you want that body, or you want three percent body fat. Or if you want to lose 100, 200 pounds, you can do these things. And, and you don't have to like go to the doctor every two weeks and have fancy health insurance to know how to do these mm-hmm. things. Another thing that happened, by the way, when I was visiting that doctor is after going there and developing these issues by following the advice, I was on a half dozen different prescription meds. Wow. And didn't need any of those, uh, especially anymore after I made those corrections. Wow. And you know what I love about this is you're saying like so many people can relate to this because they're like, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. And I guess I'm just not doing a good enough job. And it's like, right. wait, actually, maybe just try something completely different and then put all that effort in. And now you don't feel so self-defeated. And that was my experience too. I wanted to qualify for Boston, couldn't do it. I'm carb loading. I got my goose. I got my little stroopy right. waffles and my Gatorade and all that stuff. And then went low carb and boom, qualified for Boston with 17 minutes to spare. Like wow. went and did leg That's day nice. two days later. Like it was just like, oh, okay, this works, you know. So I I love that. So then, so then from this, as you're discovering your own, you're like, yay! I that feeling of like, yay, this is working, and it's amazing. Is that where the wild diet stuff started to come into play, or where did your journey go from there? Yeah, because I realized, and also coming from the world, like I've been a career musician before this, and put on shows and stuff like that. So I come at this world with a tongue in cheek perspective, right? So it's yeah. it's like I think it's important not to be super specific and say that you always have the right answers and all of that. But at the same time, um, there are very important fundamentals that, that is an education that we all kind of have to get through, through before we dial that in. So I realized that words are dangerous mm-hmm. because if you look back a hundred years, people were eating vegan and arguing with people who are eating keto, but they called it banting. And then before that, you know, there's, there's Atkins and there are all these other Weston A. Price and 
cyclic ketogenic dieting and the bodybuilding circles and combining that with different stacks of steroids and testosterone. <laughs> it's like, you can, you can really do this in all sorts of different ways and give it whatever name you want. And, and back then it was really primal paleo. We're bigger than keto. Now it's more keto carnivore, vegan stuff. And, and so I just wanted to take a minute and be like, Hmm, it's more, let's take a step back. I don't want to own any of this but nature needs to be honored here. Ooh. And also something a little bit alternative. So I, I came up with the, world, the word wild around a lot of the different projects and, and products that we've come up with over the decade of doing this. And that's protected us a little bit. We, I mean, we sacrifice a lot of growth, oddly enough, by doing things like that, right? By kind of just saying like, mm -hmm. this is kind of the way that we're going to do it. We're not going to try to convert everyone and, and try to get them to use these words too, necessarily. But like we're doing something different here, but we're doing it together. And mm -hmm. so I think when when people are coming up with brands and names for things, like we were talking about before we started this show, um, you can get all caught up in that for, for so many different reasons and in so many different ways. But I think it is important to have something that's kind of distinctly yours, no matter what it is. Like Fat Burning Man, people love that or hate it. And it's really <laughs> interesting. Like they're... The, the interactions that I have with people, they make a lot of assumptions based around that. Similar with wild superfoods and the wild diet and all of yeah. that. But I'm entertained by this. I get a kick out of it because I also write poetry and songs. And so on. I, I'm really interested in how people interpret words and yeah. what these things notes. So it, I have a lot of fun with that talking all day with fun people like you who are also obsessed with words and meaning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, wow. Okay, hold on. One, speaking of words, something you said there just like made my heart like jump out and jump for joy. And you said, um, nature needs to be honored here. Oh, like I love that so much. And I think like once you get on this path, you understand that. I always tell, I tell all my clients this. I'm like, none of us understand the human body at all. Yeah. Like yeah. we don't, like we have, we're cute. It's cute what we, I mean, we got some stuff, but like, oh, you understand the body? Like make one. Oh, right. you can't? <laughs> okay, then you don't know how it works. <laughs> so like that's, I'm the same way. Like nature is the key. It's the clues. It's like, this is how it works, right? So honoring that is what I'm hearing from you is like, let's not be so like cocky and know it all that like, I've got this figured out. I figured out the solution for all humans. Here it is. It's like, let's actually honor what's working. What's working is what we are, which is nature, yeah. which is why I love what you're doing. Thank and that, you. yeah that kind of transitions into like the, the, my diet is better than yours. Can you share that experience for people who don't know? Yeah. So this was back in 2015, 2016. And it was through tw Twitter, actually. Someone got in touch and they're just like, Hey, you'd be perfect as a coach on this new show from, from ABC. And the way it was positioned to me, no screaming trainers. It's going to be a positive show for positive people and all this yeah. stuff. We're going to do it in a different way. That turned out to be total BS, by the way. It was definitely <laughs> a reality show. They changed the name on us to something totally absurd. My diet is better than yours, which is kind of wonderful. But anyway, the yeah. premise was that five uh, people out of Atlanta, Georgia, who had probably 50 to 100 pounds to lose-ish, um, they would each be set up with a coach. So five coaches, five people, and then Sean T, you know, the, the wonderful Sean T who's yes. become a friend uh, <laughs> over the years was, was the host and kind of like main motivator. Yeah. On that show. And then Anna Kaiser was also a trainer. And so, uh, but she couldn't be fired. The twist of the show is that we could be fired. The coaches could be fired by the people they were coaching mm -hmm. if they just didn't like how, how they were treated mm -hmm. or if in the weekly weigh-ins in front of everyone where all the guys went shirtless, like in front of America, if that didn't go well, you could also be fired, like on the spot in front of America also. Awesome. So that was, it was kind of a cool <laughs> premise for a show. And I realized sure. and, and kind of knew like going into it because my wife was actually on a video, professional video gaming reality show like years before oh, that. She cool. kind of like coached me. She's like, listen, <laughs> right. they're really going to mess with you and try to do yeah. some mind bending stuff. And they did, you know, like <laughs> not feeding you, shutting you into rooms, feeding you misinformation, getting you all riled up and mad at each other, <gasps> then putting you on, on camera. Wow. Right? Like, that's kind of how reality TV wow. works. And so I got, I got matched up with Kurt Morgan, this, this wonderful dude who makes me look like a hobbit. He's like 6'4", he was 352 <laughs> pounds wow. when we got started, 52% body fat. Wow. And also had been in a serious car accident that affected his neck and had to have 
all sorts of gnarly surgeries over the years to try to correct that. So he couldn't really do heavy lifting or, or hardcore sprints or much exercise, to be perfectly honest. So after getting assigned with him and then the four pages of medical issues that he had and the fact that he couldn't really exercise, I'm like, oh, all right, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Yeah. But after, you know, he was eating the standard American diet and after having tried HCG and Atkins and eating low, low fat, low carb, low whatever over the years and failed with his wife many times, they kind of had given up recently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why they put on some some extra weight. But anyway, over the course of <laughs> um, three and a half months, 14 weeks, we got Kurt down 87 pounds. And he lost by far the most weight of anyone. He lost off the top of my head, I think it was 15 pounds the first week, 11 the second week. And he's a big guy or especially like tall. And he started off 352 pounds. So that's not a fair way to compare yourself if you're anywhere smaller than him, right? Like, so it's not about the numbers, but one thing that that was cool about the show is they, they at least had us share the body fat percentage numbers, which is so much more important than just the raw weight. For sure. And so we got him down to, and, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was below 25% body fat uh, at the crazy. end of that. And he went rock climbing. And he's a grandpa. He was, oh. he was also like coming up on 50 years of age. We're friends to this day, um, but, but the show went really well, aside from the fact that we publicly lost, even though yeah. we lost the most weight and most body fat, they're saying, no, this other person, because they kind of ate less and ran more and lost more technical body volume weight, they calculated it in a different way. Right. Like, That's the winner. Uh, um, and that bummer. became a wonderful bit of education because at the time it's like my podcast was already kind of bigger than that show. <laughs> and I had like everyone on that show on my podcast to talk about <laughs> it long form, what yeah. actually happened and yeah. how there are different ways of going about this. And, and if you want to eat way less and run a lot, you can lose weight that way, but you might lose muscle too. That's um, right. And, and so a big bit of education around that show was uh, all, like losing weight without that much exercise, but also protecting your muscle as you do that. Yeah. I always, you know, clients, they always want to go at it hard, especially like my bigger guys like that, that have like a long way to go. And they're usually high achievers too. So they're like, let's go, like the go hard or go home. Like, wait, and I'll get this question. Wait, is lifting weights making me slow down on my, on my weight loss? And I'm like, yeah, a little bit, but trust me, you yeah. want to do this. Okay. Otherwise you're going to be skinny fat. And they're like, as soon as you throw out skinny fat to a guy, they're like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I can you're wait. So right. You're so right. <laughs> so, women it's a little harder they're like no the way literally i just want to be small and i'm like no you don't because you want to be able to eat food right you're gonna be able to eat yeah. food okay then you, you don't want to just not have any muscle mass or you're not gonna have much of a metabolism that's such a cool that's such a cool thing that you did especially because you know you didn't really have to do that like you already no. had to go and all these things going for you like it wasn't like you needed the spotlight but it's so cool that you did that because it pushes that message even further to show people and like yeah just for anybody listening like what was he eating what kind of, was he eating like uh, low, low fat bagels? <laughs> Not at all. No, no. We were, he was so good about once I told him sugar bad, basically. Right. <laughs> he was like, oh, huh. Yeah, that makes sense. Wow. I can do that. Wow. And we were able to, you know, the first week, one of the things my wife and I really love to do with, with our own way of making food is make it kind of luxurious and fun and indulgent. So we went over there and made bacon cowboy burgers, just mm. like fried up the onions and bacon fat, yeah. had a bunch of avocado and had, had a bunch of greens there too. We did not sacrifice greens. I said, yeah. um, we're going to eat in some kind of wacky ways and it's going to seem way too fun to work. Um, but don't think that it's just the bacon cheeseburgers that are helping here. Like yeah. don't give up your greens, make sure that, nice. that we're maintaining um, a good diversity of, of what you're eating. And even like the types of meats that we were eating were clean. I went out of pocket and bought a lot of meals, like hundreds of dollars of bulk meat from White Oak Pastures, which is actually close to where he was at nice. um, at the time. It's just a whole bunch of different types of food. And it's like, he hadn't really eaten duck maybe ever before that. And we kind of introduced him to the fun of foods. And when you combine that with, you know, eating bacon cheeseburgers with me and my wife, who look way too small to be doing any of this, right. um, you combine that with losing 15 or 11 pounds a week and winning the fitness competition at the same time, because mm-hmm. he, he feels good and has energy. Uh, that, 
like started to win him over and, and I didn't have to work hard on him. We were doing this together, you know, and that was kind of a different, a different dynamic also as a coach, because I'm not a personal trainer. Um, and, and I'm, I don't work with people the way that a lot of personal trainers are portrayed to be working with people yeah. where they're ordering them around and, and kind of just in their face shouting at them as they do really <laughs> miserable suffer fest workouts, right? Like that's not me at all. It's so antithesis I, of a good trainer in my opinion. <laughs> well, maybe so, but also there are so many just like stereotypes, right? Like people, totally. they, they hear fat burning man or they make assumptions about what I do and they think that I'm that, which is so hilarious. Right. But, but anyway, the point of saying all this is that working with him has allowed us to continue working together. Cause I never like expended too much energy, like trying to order him around. Right. Like it's, it's more like we were building a relationship, building a friendship. And though there have been ups and downs in the, wow, like five, five years since we started filming that show, um, he's still doing awesome. You know what I mean? He's nowhere close to back to regaining all of that weight. He's gone up and down, but he's, now five years older and is like looking at his mid fifties, you know, a grandpa still working really hard, but he is, um, he's all like, that's another piece. I will lift weights. You will lift weights because like, I don't know, we will, we'll go and run too. He will do neither of those things. And there are many people like, like Kurt out there who I hadn't really necessarily interacted with that much before that show, let alone coached. Who, who are just not built that way. They're not going to do yeah, that, but right. they'll build an addition on the house in a weekend. <laughs> they'll like redo yeah. the roof or they'll like lift up a car so that their wife can put a jack underneath. And that's mm-hmm. his way of working out. Yeah. And he like literally delivers refrigerators sometimes. And he like buys and sells really heavy things and just moves them around. And uh, I think it's really important to realize that if you're going to do this for the rest of your life, that way of doing it, has to work too. You have to find a way to make whatever way work. And it's going to look different for many different people. Yeah. And I think the most beautiful part of that story is when you talked about showing him the joy of these bacon burgers and like, it's like, Hey, this is how we live. Like, this is how we do it. We get it from this beautiful, like pasture, pasture raised animals. And, and look how delicious it is. I was having a uh, talk with my mindset coach yesterday about this. And you reminded me of it so much. He was talking about psycho cybernetics and how like we have this thermostat, right? And so like we have these associations with pizza and chocolate chip cookies and all these things that bring us joy. And then we think, Oh, I have to go on a diet. Now I have to remove all joy from my life. And I think that's why people regain. And I think that story of you showing him how much joy and beauty and love can be in the healthy eating is what allowed him to keep that long term because he's like, wait, I actually like this. I actually find joy in this. It's actually delicious. It doesn't have to be this scarcity mindset of, you know, I think that's what holds people back is it's like, this is suffering and this sucks. Well, how long are you going to want to do that the rest of your life? No way. Right. So it's finding joy in the, in the, in the, the eating experience. And what did you call it? You said you, you and your wife like to make it uh, luxurious and like, yeah. <laughs> but that's it. That's it right there is like making an enjoyable experience. And when you get done, you're like, wow, that was amazing. Not like, yeah. oh, I'm starving freaking broccoli. I hate this. Like, but I got to do it because I hate myself, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So the way that we prefer to do it is more of the fasting and feasting approach. And that worked well for yeah. Kurt and, and it works well for me and my me wife. Too. And and so, I mean, you can't be eating luxuriously all the time. Right. Like in this extravagant lifestyle where you're right. eating bacon cheeseburgers as soon as soon as you wake up, then just like hitting <laughs> the cream cheese. You know, it's like yeah. so another thing that that he learned and, and we kind of learned together is listen, if you feel good fasting, um, do that. And it will help you become fat adapted at the beginning. Yeah. And then it will help you burn off that fat that you need to burn off. Cause it was primarily around his organs, like in his midst, Mm -hmm. like I wouldn't want normal people to lose weight that quickly, that amount of weight with that speed. But for someone like him who had that much metabolic dysfunction and literally he could have had a heart attack at any moment. Yeah. (laughs) If he's motivated to take that fat off as quickly as possible, let's do it, man. So fasting was, was a big part of that. And one, one trick that I myself am using, like anytime I kind of bump up over 180, I'm like, all right, buddy, let's go back down to 175. Let's keep the muscle, but let's go back down. So I take the cream, cream out of my coffee, um, in the mornings. And I'll, a lot of times do like a a low intensity workout, Um, maybe just a walk, maybe just some rows, nice and easy, not, not breathing heavy, not pulling from muscle glycogen and getting hungry, just right. kind of like a nice, easy, 
the opposite of a suffer fest where yeah. like you do it for 20 minutes and you're like, wow, I really could do this all day. Now I'm feeling good. You know, yeah. um, he did a little bit of that, but just with walking around the neighborhood and thankfully he had some Hills and he would push his, his, um, you know, grandkids in the cart, which is a little bit of weight. And if you do that for 45 minutes with just a bit of black coffee, most days. And yeah. then before that you were eating cereal or you were getting like a crawler or a donut and you were eating ice right. cream at night, you're going to have amazing results. And he had incredible, the best, literally the best results I've ever seen or the best results I had ever seen then. And then people watched that and were inspired by him. And then I got in touch with so people are still getting in touch with me today. who were like, I lost a hundred pounds. I had zero exercise that whole time. Like there was, yeah. there were articles written about people who especially had incredible results by not doing any exercise at all after yeah. seeing her. And I was like, that's, that's <laughs> next level. Like yeah. I couldn't have done that. I have no idea how you did that. So I invited some of them like Tommy Whitaker, if you want, guys want to look it up on my podcast to ask them how they managed yeah. to do that. Cause I'm different. It's like, I, I love running. I like yeah. lifting weights. Yeah. And so the people who are able to skip that whole part and just focus on nutrition, because that was the thing. He's like, when I talked to Tommy, he's like, listen, man, I'm not going to lift weights. I'm not going to go running. I'm not going to do any of this, you know, fitness bunny stuff that, that you and your fitness friends do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but I can put all my energy into eating right. Will that work? And it's like, yeah, that can work too. And I've just been astounded by how well that works. I'll always be an advocate for exercising and getting out right. there and staying strong and all of that. But the people who are able to do this in their own way. I mean, props to you. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I lived that during coronavirus because I am a personal trainer and I love, and I love the nutrition piece too. But during coronavirus, I let go of my like, wake up at 4 30 AM, crush the day, like, you know, morning routine. Go to, I was just like, you know what? There's no gym open. I'm just going to like sleep in and I'll just do my morning routine when I wake up. And wow, my, my appetite went down so much that I drifted into one meal a day. I just really wasn't hungry until wow. like one. And then like I feasted and then I just like, wasn't hungry anymore. And I started to get a little hungry at night, but I'm like, Oh, it's nine o'clock now. I'm not going to eat again. And so I just drifted into this. And I, so I basically stopped working out for two months and I lost 16 pounds and I'm already pretty wow. lean. Like I was really, really shocked by that, you know? And I was like, okay, so sleep. So I actually, I'm still doing one meal a day. I love it. I think it is so amazing. And it's more like, eh, sometimes it's a four hour long Feast, right? So yeah. it's not really one meal. It's not like I'm just having a bowl of, you know, chicken salad and that's all I eat all day long. Right. It's more like a big feast, you know, for this short amount of time. But it's 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 incredible, even for those of us who have been intermittent fasting for a long time. And I know you guys have to, you've been intermittent fasting for like a decade, yeah. 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 <laughs> In different ways. And when I first started, it was more 16-8 on the 16-8 side of things. Yeah. Where I would start eating around noon. Yeah. Um, my lifestyle was totally different. I was in my mid twenties. I'm in my mid thirties now. Not that that's a massive difference, but we live in a completely different place. Our habits are completely different. Yeah. And I want to work out differently. And I also want to eat less. Like back then I really wanted to eat a lot. Yeah. And now I just, oftentimes I don't, sometimes I do, but most of the time I don't. And so uh, I don't really get hungry until I start eating. <laughs> and you yeah. can use that to your advantage as long as you don't push it too hard and too long. Yeah. But you know, once you're fat adapted and you were, you were talking to Drew about doing the, the ultra running events and all yeah. that and, and not being a natural runner and, and that sort of thing. Um, I think what so much of that is, is the fat adaptation, right? Because yeah. like as a runner who wasn't really that well fat adapted and, and ran many years that way to now where my typical workout, I'll do this like once a week, we live at 8,000 feet here in Colorado and I'll run like five to seven miles up and down the mountain, do sprints in the heat wow. with very low humidity, like rough. And I'll do it fasted or yeah. as a treat, I'll just have a little Manuka honey drop that I can suck on and it'll last the whole run. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I haven't had, this is the most sugar I've had in a long time. Wow. And, um, as long as I get enough salt and I don't bring any water or anything. Um, but that's how I am too. <laughs> yeah. It's, if you can, if you can do that, that's, that's also next level, you know, yeah. like I want I want my metabolism to be efficient. I want to be able to pull from fat stores when I need to. And right. those people who are able to run a hundred miles without right. fueling, that's pretty cool too. And I think that we all have that ability if we train ourselves up and kind of, I, I think of it as right. getting ourselves the chops. Like that's how you call it in music. You got to get the chops first. And what that mm -hmm. means is like, you have to <laughs> sit down practice diligently 
not once, not intensely. It's not about intensity, right. but with consistency over a long period of time. And if you do that, then you'll slowly but surely, and you work on the things that you're bad at, you work on your weak spots, then eventually you'll get the chops enough to be able to do these things. Amen. That's beautifully said. Just I just said that to my clients this morning on a call. Like she's one of my clients is like, I can't work out fasted. Like I just can't. And I'm like, you yeah. can't right now, but you will be mm-hmm. able to more and more the more you do it. Right. So I'm like, you can, it just doesn't feel as awesome as usual. Cause you're, you're adapting right now. Adapting, adapting is uncomfortable, but look what you're saying. I mean, like guys, did you hear him? He just said he's at 8,000 feet elevation. I don't know if people really put that in perspective, but here in Salt Lake city, we're like 4,000 feet elevation. So like, that's like double, that's really, really high. And you're doing that with nothing, but you're what's inside your own body, pretty much maybe a teeny bit of honey or something. And that's yeah. cool because then, you know, I don't know about you, but I was down in Austin for paleo effects, I think. And I went yeah. for a run. I was going to go for a three mile run. And it was so amazing because I was so at sea level. I ran 10 miles. I, totally. just, I could not stop. I was like, <laughs> and I felt like I just kept getting faster and faster and faster. And that's a really cool experience when you train your body to do something really hard. And yeah. then you go back to like easy. It's just, you're, you feel like a superhuman. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I would encourage those people. I was thinking about it. I'm like, why don't I do this? I came back from a run and it was too hot and like too overworked to even want to eat dinner. My one meal of the day. Right. And then eventually I did, you know, a couple hours after I cooled down and all that. I'm like, why don't I do this? It's so hard. It's because I did it one thing at a time. When we first moved up to this altitude, um, we'd kind of like I, I like how high altitude. I love the mountains. But yeah, the first time sure. I tried running at 7,500 feet like in, in Flagstaff, I was like, <gasps> and, and then the first like just mild incline I got was, I had to stop and I wanted to barf. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah, and yeah. it's legit. You know, so when we yeah. first moved here, I wasn't really running that much and I was taking it easier. I had to adjust my workouts and you yeah. can't really work out with the intensity no. that you can at sea level. You just can't. It's a different thing, but you can become a lot more efficient. So when I was not running, I had a similar experience when we first went to, to Colorado. It was, the, it was the winter and it was icing up and we were on hills and stuff. It's just like, I couldn't run there if I even wanted to. It was like too dangerous. Yeah. It, w- it would have been kind of silly. <laughs> um, but we went to go visit my folks who live now down in Florida at sea level. And I'm just like, huh, I wonder if I could do like the normal run that I, that I would have done when I was in running shape by yeah. their house. And I just rolled out and ran five miles and felt amazing the whole time. <laughs> like, like I didn't have to take a breath the whole time. I'm like, what is happening here? I'm not yeah. even trained for this at all. And not that I wasn't training, you know, I was still lifting weights and I know that you're a big fan of lifting and running. I'm a fan yeah. of that combo and that, that hybrid scenario amazing. as well. Yeah. I think it's, it's, protected me from so many injuries that I used to get for sure. Right? Um, and, and so many other things, but anyway, there are many aspects to this. <laughs> and I would suggest that you don't do them all at the same time. You don't yeah. go for the hardest thing all at the same time. I'll bring it back to music once again. Cause like I also study bebop and jazz and I'm not very good at that, that style of music. It can be really complex. And if you try to tackle these songs with these rapid chord changes and sometimes really rapid tempos, you'll fall apart right at the beginning and learn nothing. You could spend mm-hmm. just, you know, hours, you could spend your entire life banging your head against a wall. What you have to do is break it up into tiny little pieces and kind of tackle them one at a time. You can do one measure at a time. You can do one line at a time, you know? Wow. And so if you focus on small things and getting that right and then moving on to the next thing, then you can start stacking the hard stuff and get to that superhuman level. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. That was my topic for my coaching call this morning. Habit stacking, right? Just stacking one habit yeah. on top of the next. And you're right. That's why I think we get so overwhelmed. Like if I was going to try to learn to, you got all these instruments behind you. And I'm like, if I was going to try to learn how to play all those, like, <laughs> I mean, I would just, I would give up. I'd be like, I can't, I, I, yeah. I can't, I can't apparently, you know, and that's what happens with health and fitness too. And it's like, Oh, totally. you totally can. You're just like putting way too much pressure on yourself all at one time. Yeah. Okay. I have to, I have to ask you about the no internet thing. Cause I'm just so curious. So you and your wife went for like almost a year without any internet at all. Like none. It wasn't 0%. But um, like, well, pretty, like you didn't have internet. <laughs> 
At your we did not have internet and and we've done this a couple of times, by the way. So oh my gosh, share. some of the times we'll have a little bit of cell service, most of the time not, because we lived on the road out of an yeah. RV yeah. for for a few years there. We lived in the mountains of Tennessee, Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains, and we had oh my internet that was I continued to do my show with an up and download limit of 20 gigs a month, which would cut out any time clouds or weather came over. <laughs> Oh, wow. Combining that with like a little bit of rise in service, we were able to continue doing some of the show uh, that time. That was that was before the ABC TV show days even. And um, the most recent time, it's just we didn't have good internet up in the mountains of Colorado, the first place we moved. And so we're just like, well, we still ha- we have a small team and there are kind of like automated processes you can use to publish things. And we did essentially reruns of the show republished. We've been doing this for a while. So a lot of people yeah. haven't heard the shows from right. five or six years ago or, or right. now like 10 years ago. And so bringing those back up at the right time can be powerful yeah. for people. So um, that was, yeah, it was, it was a really powerful experience because so many uh, people who are, you know, around our age, but certainly younger are just connected all the time. And yeah. many people who have now been raised in that environment and have never disconnected. I grew up in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire and uh, the power went out during an ice storm for 10 plus days. Like I believe more than once we would lose power. It was all a thing. We knew exactly what to do. We knew where the candles yeah. and the, the flashlights and the board games were. We knew yeah. how to get by without showers if we had to. Right. And so I think that well, also, you know, the phone would go out. We didn't have internet. We didn't even have cable until I went away to college. You know, it wasn't even like by our house. And so my default mode is kind of without those things. <laughs> peace. Yeah, peace. <laughs> when you realize that that none of this stuff is necessary at all, especially social media, and that, in fact, the thing that really set me off, I didn't use Instagram for like two years, one or two years uh, almost at all, even though I had, I'd like 40,000 followers at the time. I still have 40,000. And I was just like, <laughs> but, um, not, I read an article that was in no small terms saying, if you use Instagram, you're going to be sadder than if you don't, you're going to be more anxious and depressed. And if you use it a lot, you're going to be really depressed wow. and coming from brain science and mental health, which is kind of my background in education. Mm. And, and also you know, my background, realizing that all of this is completely unnecessary. I really value those uninterrupted hours of time to do creative things Mm -hmm. instead of consuming, which is what we're being trained to do almost every second that we're on um, technology these days. We used to create things and, and I try to keep doing that even for ridiculous and unnecessary reasons and and ones that might be over the edge, according to some people, like my new book in humor and satire has, has kicked the hornet's nest and it's an audio book and poetry and all this stuff. And makes no sense to release after a diet book and cookbook series. And that makes no sense to release as after like an academic investigation and research project into music and the brain. Like none of this makes any sense Mm. and none of it matches up with, with fat burning man either. But to me, it's all the same and it's all one. And, these are kind of like interdisciplinary adventures and explorations and rabbit holes that will inform each other eventually. In the same way that I was using metaphors talking about music, when I get tendonitis from playing too much piano or doing scales, it's the same in my fingers from playing music as it is in my Achilles when I'm doing runs up the mountain. And you can learn from these things. And the more that you apply yourself, develop yourself and, and get into that creative mode of production instead of consumption, then you realize that it's worth it. And, and that's not to say that I don't use social media. Now, I use it in a very targeted and specific way. I go in there to spar sometimes and to connect with people. Yeah. And if you do it that way, selectively and intentionally, you can do it your own way and it doesn't have to be bad. But I would recommend for most people, if not everyone, take whatever amount of time sounds scary to you away from all media and shut your phone off if you can, you know, shut all of it off. And it, it doesn't have to be any harder than just unplug your router, unplug your router at night. Just try this, unplug your router at night, 
And before you know it in the morning, you'll probably be on a device. Shut your cell service off too, right? Like mm-hmm. just shut it all off. And then try to go like with fasting without food, try to just push that back and, and put it back later in the day. Try to put something good there instead. <laughs> maybe something yeah. spiritual, maybe some jur- journaling, maybe a bit of meditation or the yoga and Pilates and Qigong and Tai Chi you've always wanted to learn. Put it there, just five, 10 minutes. Yeah. You have it now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I heard um, Ryan Holiday talking about this recently on an interview with Jay Shetty. He was saying that like what started as 30 minutes in the morning with no phone is now five or six hours, right? Because yeah. he's like, if I want to create, he's like, I'm a writer. If I want to create and write, like I have to have that time, like taking my, he has like a baby, you know, little little guy, like take my baby for a walk and like being outside and yeah. having peace. And he told this story that I thought was incredible. It reminds me so much what you're saying is like he, he was finding out how his new book had done. Like he saw, he saw like, like an email, I think he said, come in from his, from his publisher. And he's like, no, like, no, like I'm not, he he glanced and saw it for a second. He's like, I'm not going to look at that because I still got like three hours and whatever that news is, it's going to affect me so that I can't create for the next three hours. I'm going to get all caught up in it, you know? And you think of like starting to look at your phone and you're just nothing, you get done and nothing, you have nothing to show for it. You just maybe some frustration or anger or some weird loop that keeps you from creating the life you really want. And I, I do, I, um, I, I, I just challenged my sister to get off all dating apps um, nice. two days ago. And I'm calling, I'm like, how you doing? How you doing? Cause she's just like stressed to the max. She's stressed. And I'm like, it just, it sucks up all our time. We don't realize to the point that we can't create. The yeah. other thing I love that you're doing Abel is like you're breaking the rules a little bit. Like you're only supposed to be the fat burning man. Mm -hmm. That's all you can do. Like you can only be that guy, you know, and you're like, no, actually I'm going to be like a musician and a songwriter and win awards for that. And his book, by the way, the humor is called, um, designer baby still have scabies. Did I say that right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like, you're like, no, I, because that's what came to you intuitively and is passionate for you. And look how well it's done. It's like number one book in like eight countries and it's a bestseller. And the podcast has been number one for, you know, what was it like five years in a row was number one on Apple, 50 million downloads. It's like, and that's just from you pure coming purely from where you're at and what you want to create it's- and burning out sometimes to be perfectly honest. You know what I mean? It's like, like yeah. I said, mental health is so important. And I've, I've come to moments in my career, in every career that I've had, whether it's music consulting and fat burning man, health stuff, writing books where I totally burn out. And sometimes I don't realize it. Sometimes you burn out way before you realize it. So, mm-hmm. you know, people on, on dating apps are probably completely burned out because anytime you're in that reactive stage, you know, I had been, you know, I did a big book with major publisher and I had all these major app projects and then I had a major TV show and I'm just like back and forth. These people working all the time. Then I'm coaching people and I'm helping them. Mm-hmm. And after a while I just needed a break. I, and mm-hmm. I needed to figure out like, is this really what I want to do too? this for the rest of the time. Like, do I even keep this going? I've had that thought many times. And, uh, I think that's perfectly natural and important to have these thoughts and honor that and, and, and spend some time with that. Because once you do, I hated social media. There was no way I was going to use Instagram for that, that year. But now I pop in multiple times a day and like talk to a bunch of my friends and meet new people. Mm -hmm. even on Twitter, even where people are just like (laughs) trying to kill each other and at each other's throats. I'm still making friends in there and and making friends with the haters and stuff, but I wouldn't have the ability to get in there with that attitude and mindset and and be able to put up with all that if I hadn't taken a lot of time off and, and thought about why I'm doing this. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, my, my friend, Josh Trent, who I know, you know, as well, he told me yeah. to tell you hello, by the way, I was just texting right on. Hey, before this. He's like, hello, why? but Josh shared such an incredible story of himself with, with wellness force of like having that intuitive pool of like, you're forcing it now. You're forcing it now. Like just shift, shift, shift. And that's what I'm hearing from you is like, you're just like, wait now, like all the joy is gone. I'm stressed the hell out. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, yeah pause and like allowing that question of like, do I want to do this? Am I doing what I want to do? Or can I allow myself that freedom to shift mm-hmm. even after all this success? Cause I can see like how it'd be very easy. It's like, no, I found something that worked. Like I have to be locked into this. Like, this is it. This is all I got. And you're saying no, like bringing in that abundance and allowing yourself to breathe and create the life that you want instead yeah. of feeling locked into something. It's kind of the same concept as being locked into your job at the office as a receptionist that you hate. It's the same mentality, yeah. really. It's like, I have to do this because this is safe and I found success here. You know, you're saying like, screw that. No. Yeah. People <laughs> will paint you into a corner. 
Mm-hmm. They, they will every time. And if you let them do that, you're going to be trapped there wondering how that ever happened. You know, yeah. kind of just like people who spend, <laughs> they're at a party with a sheepdog and all of a sudden they're all herded in the corner. Like that happens to us without us really realizing yeah. it. Yeah, and wow. for our own sanity, it's important to, to take a step back and reevaluate every once in a while. From a business perspective, it completely yeah. changes. We've had to shift our business model many times. We've lost our pants. We've made millions. We, and, and usually it's, it's breaking even. And the years that we've done really well have been very few. And the ones where we're just kind of like cruising by, but working really hard in our own way, doing different stuff is every single one of them. Even the, yeah. when we're unplugging, we're working really hard, just on a totally different obsession. One, yeah. one of them was finding a place where we wanted to live, like a state, I mean, and, and we lived in more than a dozen states. We lived with, in, close to, to both families and parents and multiple corners of the country. We, we traveled to different countries and entertained if we wanted to maybe live there. And, uh, and it's so important to reevaluate from time to time because it, it might change, but if you choose your life very intentionally, then you can kind of like, we're in Colorado now and I'm, I don't see any reason to leave. This is the first yeah. time I've ever felt like that. And nice. I, I, we've lived in a bunch of other places in Colorado that did not feel like that at all. Wow. We had to try out a bunch of them before we really felt like this. So sometimes I think, I know our mutual friend L talks about confidence. And I think a lot of times that confidence comes from questioning and stepping back for a minute before you rush forward with, with whatever decision is just kind of like there, which is what most people do. Like we just... Yeah we'll automatically cruise through life without really doing what we want um, if we let life do that to us. And so we have to just yeah. like constantly take that step back, I think. And as coaches, we need to reevaluate what we're saying and if, if that advice is useful anymore, because that changes True. too. Like the whole, even just being online as creators before it was like, yeah, fat burning man is a thing. You can only be that. And now like in the past like year or two, all these people in mainstream media are, are shutting their homes, like kind of on Zoom or Skype, like the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Professionalism is gone, and we're all kind of doing this in our own way, and no one knows how to do it. And that's okay, mm-hmm. you know, but you have to adapt and realize that we're all real people, and you can't just be the TV show news anchor anymore. Now you have to let out other pieces of yourself because otherwise you'll get canceled. People will find that piece and they'll cancel you or whatever. It's a totally different dynamic. And you also can't say too much because then you'll get canceled and you can't use the same words that you could use five or 10 years ago, certainly. So uh, yeah, that all takes time. And what I do is like, I'll take a good, I record a bunch, I batch it up. Then I take a bunch of time off and I just read books a lot of the times about things that I I don't like reading about social media, but I read three social media books before I got back in and started sparring with people again. Wow. I read three of them in like a weekend because I feel like it's a responsibility to like, I didn't know what the stories were, right? Like it's just, I never got into Snapchat. I, I don't know why these different social media platforms are doing all these different things or why anyone would ever use them. So like, I sucked it up and read a bunch of books about it. I'm like, oh, this makes sense. This is how awesome. I could use it artistically. And so I did some piano improvisations and this is how I could do it and maybe calm some, some nerves right now. And I sang a song for people and they loved that. And it's wow. just like, Oh, this is fun again. Right. Wow. But you need to go wow. through that education from time to time. Yeah. I love what you're saying. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cause like, usually it's like what we do or I think our egos like to be like, I don't, I don't care about that. I don't like that because we really, we don't understand it, you know? So it's yeah, like, we totally. don't understand it. So we reject it. We make judgments mm-hmm. about it, but you went straight into the eye of the storm and you're like, let me learn about it. And then you were able to find joy in it, which is so beautiful because now what it's open more opportunities for you to grow, to be happy. And like, we just, we won't do that. It's like, you know, I, I, I'm, there's no way I'm like looking into veganism. <laughs> it's like, wait, then right. I got like my, my coach who coaches me, she's a vegan. I'm like, okay, okay. I love Love you like I'll look into it, you know. And I'm like, okay, I can see why you guys like. I, I see where you're coming from on some of this stuff, you know. Instead of just like rejecting it because we don't, we don't even want to look into it, you know. And that's 
That's really beautiful. And I can make a mean salad, man. They make some great food. There's a lot of like nutritional yeast. Thank you, vegans. Like all of these, all of these recipes that taste, they have definitely learned how to make vegetables taste amazing. So exactly. There's so much that can be learned from anything. If we're just like a little bit open-minded to receiving it instead of just poo-pooing it because our ego is like, it's not for me. Right. Well, even for me. Yeah. It's like unplugging from social media, knowing that it's bad, feeling way better about it. It's pretty easy to get in the position. And now I see a lot of people doing this. Like I'm better than social media. I don't need social media. (laughs) And the thing that made it easiest for me to understand was the reason that we all started this, got online, got into forums, chat rooms, and social media was to connect with each other. Yeah. It's as simple as that. That's right. They're all messaging platforms. They're all just like AOL instant messenger. I used to, you know, message with, with some of my best friends when I was a teenager and and my girlfriends and my cousins and all that. And I had fun and we got into fights and it was fun. And, uh, and so if you think of it all as a messaging platform to connect with real people, ignore the bots, ignore the hate, engage with the haters. If you want, I've made a lot of friends that way. Yeah. I mean, a lot of friends awesome. in the carnivore community because I gave them some crap, they gave me some crap, and now we're just like getting each other's backs. That is awesome. Yeah, that's for for me too. I I, I always tell I tell people all the time. I'm like, I love social media. Just so, I, mean, <laughs> I am kind of being a brat. I'm kind of being a brat, yeah. but I really do because I'm very outgoing by nature. I love meeting new people. I love connecting, and it allows me to do that. So I will admit, I'm not much of a consumer. So like my friends, I'm like, I'm sorry, I probably am not going to see your stuff very much. Maybe if yeah. it's like one of the top three, and I just for a second scroll through. But because when you are putting out content all the time, it can overtake your life. But it's still becomes a way for us to connect. And that's the thing is I feel like there's like, there's a balance there because it's a different kind of connection, right? It's definitely very different than sitting out in your backyard, laying in the grass with your wife or your kids or whoever it is. That's a whole nother level of connection, but there's still more connection at our fingertips if we'll embrace some of these things that we resist. Um, And we can't wait for it to be perfect either. I would love for it to be perfect. I would love for it to be better and different than it is in so many ways. But if we're going to be prevented from going to conferences and hanging out and hugging and dancing together and playing music, then let's, let's dance with this and adapt around it and realize that it's a game and it's an uphill battle. And that's what we're doing. We're playing a game kind of, you know, and we're playing with the rules. We're bending the rules sometimes and we're having fun with it. And, and if you dance with it that way, I think that's the only way you're going to get through this without getting stomped. You know? Oh, true. Be adaptable. It's like what I'm hearing from you, like from the get go of this whole interview with your doctor and your cholesterol and your triglycerides and doing, you know, I'm doing it this way and this is the right way. It's just adaptable, 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 adaptable. And just like making the best of every situation you find yourself in, which is just be such willing a to be lesson. wrong. Yeah, yeah, be willing to like have your past self be wrong. Right, right. That's that's okay. We're all wrong all the time. And if you're not wrong right, if you are wrong right now and you keep going in that wrong direction because you think it's right, that's bad. We need, <laughs> need to accept that that's bad. Sometimes things are a little wrong and a little right. We need to accept that too, right? There, there's yeah. no perfect food or exercise. Like sometimes you're doing good and bad at the same time and you need to balance that. Yeah. I think following that, that intuition that we all have, some of us embrace it more than others, but that intuitive feeling of, you know, sometimes for me, it's like, let that project go. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like that, I like built my whole brand around that. Like that's, I've spent like $20,000 on that project. Like, no. And it's like, okay, well, things are just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse for you until you listen, but that's okay. You can keep doing it if you want to. <laughs> that's what happens is it just is like, Wah. and I'm like, man, I should have listened six months ago. I knew, I knew, but I was like, so locked into it. And that's what it, that's what bad is to me is it like life just starts to suck more and more the more you stay locked into these things that you think are safe, but your, yeah. your higher self is like, please let it go. Please let it go. Please let it go. And you're like, no, I can't because right. of all this programming. <laughs> totally. And, and you need to adapt your business too. Like if I wanted to uh, try to pay my team on my poetry book and music, no way we would right. have to shut down right away. Like I made right. hundreds of dollars <laughs> with, <that laughs> with international best-selling books, you know, because <laughs> I would rather get, so that's the other thing, like all these different domains and projects don't try to squeeze money out of all of them and don't try to make successes out of the ones that mm. maybe money comes from. You know what I mean? Like yeah. don't try to squeeze everything for something different than what its function is. Wow. And so if you're putting out books and you're doing coaching and you're trying all these different things, honor each one for what it is. And yeah. for me, one thing that I've learned about books, having made a little bit of money, you know, a fair amount of money, but not near enough to really like pay my team and keep all of this 
this going? Because it costs yeah. a lot of money to have scale these days and to have hosting yeah. and all that. For us, it's like it's been 15 grand a month for years. Yeah. And like it's a lot of books <laughs> in pure profit to meet that every month. You got to get creative. Right. So right. um find the right ways to build your thing, pay your team and do your thing and, and get your message out there at the same time. Cause it's going to be a bunch of different things. Yeah. I love that. All right. Last thing. What, what's lighting you up right now on a personal level? Like what's got your heart? Like, Oh, I just love this. What's, what's your obsession, current obsession. It's very fun for my past self to be different from my current self. Like the amount of time that I'm spending, for example, on email and in social media would make me nauseous just like a few months or <laughs> a certain years it. ago. But I'm like getting in there and I'm getting after it because right. like I said, we can't, I would otherwise be many conferences deep, many speaking engagements and, and, and so many things I wanted to do. I was supposed True. to be doing a TV show right now on wow. a major TV show that, you know, all of that, everything on pause, oh, right? You, so you got to adapt. And so I'm, I'm really excited about kind of doing that. And at the same time, my wife and I built Wild Superfoods, yeah. which is for supplementation and also down the road, you know, shelf stable foods and nutrients and ingredients that we can use for our recipes. So now we're going in that nice. direction with wow. collagen cocoa and future greens and using Ooh. recipes and that sort of thing. And so cool. that allows us to well, be wait, our own sponsor. What's future greens? Future greens is powdered fruit and veg. It's like mm-hmm. a combination of nice. over a dozen different, you know, superfoods. Right yeah. To yeah, yeah. Use that, that word that everyone hates, but, you know, spirulina, <laughs> chlorella, yeah. and. I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> They're superfoods. People can just be so judgmental. They are. They're amazing. I know. It, it's wonderful <laughs> because, like I said, I get a kick out of words. So sometimes I use them just to, like, see how people react. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I consider, the like, most of the things that we sell are highly concentrated superfoods slash nutraceuticals and concentrated nutrients that are shelf stable. So I, I yeah. like, we're excited about that because it's a whole new thing, very different for us. Yeah. I would have snubbed my nose at that five years, three years ago. Like I, I, we thought about this many years before we actually did it because I've seen so many people do it wrong. Yeah. But I've also met a lot of people who do it right. And, and over the, the journeys over the years, I, I've just learned how important not being nutrient deficient is and having diversity in your diet and having a real plan to get the right things in there. So, um, we, we've spent a lot of time and money building that now it's like ready to go and we're kind of getting off the ground. So I'm really psyched about doing this bizarre off the wall content and sparring with people online and getting that out there at yeah. the same time. What's the, what's the website for the, is it wildfoods.com? Wild or superfoods. Wild superfoods.com. They can, that's, that's where right. they can find yeah. that. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm a huge proponent of that and support you all the way because I have found that when your body has the nutrients it wants, it stops searching. Right. That's why nutrient density is so important. Cause I, you know, for the first time in the history of humankind, we're overfed and malnourished. Yep. Yep. Holy crap. And that's one of the reasons I think I used to eat so much and be so hungry because I wasn't supplementing in my twenties like I am now. Now I am. And I, I honestly need to eat a lot less than I I used to. Yeah. Nutrient density is everything. It's like your body's like, yeah, I'm good. I don't, you don't need to keep searching in these empty right. like wheat thins or whatever you're, you know, d- reduced fat wheat thins <laughs> or whatever it is you're eating. Like if you eat something packed with nutrients, your body's like, okay, yeah, yeah, we're good here. Like go live, go enjoy, yeah. enjoy your life. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. And then, um, let's see. So fatburningman.com is what, probably where they can find everything that they want to find about you. You guys probably, probably know who Abel is. If you're listening to my podcast, I'm sure you have come across Abel somewhere in your journey. <laughs> So thank you so, so much for coming on today. You are just like a breath of fresh air in the health industry. You're leading the way. And I'm really, really grateful to have interviewed you today. Thank you. Oh, you're wonderful. It, it's it's such a great experience to talk to someone else who is in it. And, you know, I, it was a lot of fun to listen to your show before coming on. And Thanks. I went in deep, you know, with Drew and some some old friends and all the rest of it. And you're doing such a wonderful job. And I always get a kick out of seeing people who are just getting started with like the interview thing and you are really good at it. Most people are publicly bad for a long time (laughs) before they ever get to like, you're just, it feels very natural. And I I can tell you're a very social person and really smart, but you are built for this. So keep doing it. We need you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been so fun today. I love, I love talking all of these things that where we're connecting to nature, we're finding our own path, we're forging your own path. So yeah, thanks for sharing your heart and your soul with us today. Thank you. you.